Choban stories. My guests this week are two brothers, two very special brothers who pushed the boundaries of the Choban era, mainly as writers. But we'll hear more about that as we go through. Tommy and Jimmy Swarbrick, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure great, to be here, Steve. Great to be here. It was a, a magical moment when we came in here today into the ballroom of romance here in Glen Farn, because, Tommy, you said, ah, romantic interlude. <laughs> what was that about? Well, uh, I played here, uh, I joined Joe Dolan and the Drifters as a very young man, and we were up here, we played it many times, but the first time was in 1962, and the uh, owner or manager of the ballroom uh, arrived on stage in the middle of our set, and uh, which incidentally was five hours long in those days. Five. <laughs> Nine to two. <laughs> what was his name, the manager? John McGivern. John McGivern. And John arrived onto the stage in an immaculate tuxedo and bow tie and announced, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you are, uh, I'm delighted to present a world famous romantic interlude. And with that, uh, all of the lights along each side of the ballroom were switched off. There were no dimmers then. No, just switched off. <laughs> and the only light that was on was a light at the very back of the hall. And we were instructed we had to play soft, romantic music. And John, first of all, would announce the latest engagements or marriages that emanated from meeting here in the Rainbow Ballroom in Glenfarn during the romantic interlude. And then we would play soft music like Jim Reeves, Put Your Sweet Lips a Little, or whatever. And they'd all snuggle up to each other in a great old time in, during John's romantic interlude. The very first man to sort of introduce romance in a big way to the ballrooms. You went on to great things. I mean, as songwriters, and you, you also went on to represent your country and Eurovision, all of these great, great things. But let's go back to the very beginning. You came from a very musical family, both of you, didn't you? A very musical and very large family. Yeah. There were 11 of us. 11? <laughs> yes. Including your father and mother? No, no. Was 13. Plus our father and mother. <laughs> there was 11 children. There was yeah. seven girls and three boys. Right. Our grandfather was uh, taught the, the brass band in Good Hill, as did my father, and also they uh, taught the choir. Right. So there was always music in the family. Yeah. So you were uh, brought into it at a very well, early yeah, age? Oh, a very early age. Yeah. I remember sitting in the freezing cold courthouse in Coot Hill uh, while Dad was on the podium instructing us on the rudiments of music. Right. And, uh, you know, wishing it was over quick because it was cold in there. Yeah. I mean, in, in the brass bands, there was, it wasn't just a, let's go down and play a few. It was a great community spirit, wasn't there? In the oh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we used to, you know, we played out at Tanna, where there was a, in, just outside Coot Hill, where there was a huge brass band um, fe festival. Right. Uh, and there would be brass bands from all over the country at it. Yes. And it was uh, very uh, special. It, it was. Tr uh, do you played as well? Well, I started playing, but then by the time Tommy was playing, I had gone t to uh, England. All right. Because I left Good Hill uh, just over 15, nearly 15 and a half. Right. Uh, went to London uh, to work. What year was that? <laughs> that was 19, 19, left in 1959. 59. Yeah. So, so by, the, been, by the time you were independent in, in London... Oh, no, would, 58, sorry. 50, 58. Yeah. Yeah. So that was... The, at that time you would have had, you would have had the, the, the Teddy Boys and the, uh, the... Cliff Richard, I suppose, would have been uh, very yeah, much... Yeah, the Mods and Rockers mods and, rockers and, and all that sort of thing, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. When did you first experiment with songwriting? Well... I used to send uh, poems. I, used, I was into poems. Yeah, he was time. into poetry. I was into and music. I used to send a few home to Tommy to, right. to see uh, what he thought about them. And he was starting to write a bit of music. Yeah. So he started using 
some of the the, the poems. <laughs> yeah, there was one very dramatic one that arrived, and I said, "Wow, this is great!" It was called "Minutes to Midnight." I remember it. Well. And I put the music to that, and that was one of the first ones. That was one of the first. Together. Yeah. You enjoyed. Uh, there was drifter mania there at the time, so it was it was a, a great time to be in a, in a show band. But you had other fish to fry. You wanted to push the boundaries, and this is where the Swarbricks come into their own. You wanted to perform your own songs. Yeah, I mean, but the way at the time I saw it, you know, we had a wonderful, wonderful career with Joe Dolan yeah. and the Drifters. And um, Joe, like, remained an absolutely phenomenal artist all his life. Yes. And he was a true, truly exceptional. Yes. Uh, there's nobody quite like him, really. Um, and, um, but it was always going to be Joe Dolan and the Drifters. It was yes. never going to be Tommy Swarbrick and the Drifters. In the meantime, we had started writing. And Joe, in fairness to him, recorded my earliest songs and put them on uh, the singles as B-sides. Yeah. And some of them were fairly bad. So I would always put my cap up to him and say, Joe, you were a great one. And he always encouraged me yeah. to write. Yes. And, uh, you know, gradually I got a bit better and the songs became a little bit more acceptable. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then he recorded a, you know, a couple on, on, uh, on albums and things like that. And um, so, you know, we kept writing and Jimmy kept sending me lyrics and we really were planning to form our own band right. and try the singer-songwriter route yeah. uh, because we were really both into it we were at this stage. interested in it, yeah. that's what we and, wanted to do. Um, that must have been very exciting to think that you're going to get out there, have a band perform you, because it was happening all over the world, so why not Ireland? Well, yes, that's, well, that's what we saw, yeah. and we thought that we, you know, we could give it a go as well. Like, mm. We didn't think we were great songwriters, but we thought we had something to, uh, to offer, you know, so... Yes, you also had a lovely harmony blend, which they say only brothers can have. And that it's a sort of instinctive thing, you know. Um, yeah, you, you sort of, you, you roll into it and you just sort of, it, we used to instantly take up a role. Sometimes I would be the lead and a certain song, Jim would do harmony, and sometimes we would know who the song suited best. Yeah. So sometimes I was the lead singer and sometimes he was, depending on the song. So water finds its own level, you, it, it instinctively yes. happens. Yeah. When yeah. you think back to some of the great, sort of the, especially say the Everly Brothers and the, the harmonies were, that you just couldn't get it to happen if, unless the people were very close spiritually as well as everything else. I so, think so, yeah. yeah. You were about to enter into this fabulously exciting new phase of your careers. I'd love to hear you give us a rendition of Looking Through the Eyes of a Beautiful Girl, a song that you wrote yourselves. The first big one for you, wasn't it? It oh, was indeed, and we'd love to do it. Yeah, pleasure. Tommy and Jimmy Swarbrick with their own composition, Looking Through the Eyes of a Beautiful Girl. Look at her walking, everyone stopping to stare as she passes them by. Get a token, everyone turning their heads for a look from her eye. Look at her moving, think she stepped out of a dream. What am I gonna do if I to make her mine? Bide my time, cause she's so fine. I said she's looking through the eyes of a beautiful girl. Cause it's the only way she She looks it shows There's something about the way she looks around It's almost heavenly Don't you know she's looking through the eyes of a beautiful girl And I'll never rest a day till she looks straight at me 
everyone knows it I just can't hide what's inside And my heart gives me away Everything shows it All that I think and I do And in all that I say Everyone trying Trying to keep her from me What am I gonna do to make her look my way? Come what may I gotta say That she is looking through the eyes Of a beautiful girl Cause it's the only way she knows She's looking through the eyes Of a beautiful girl And everywhere she looks it shows Something about the way she looks around It's almost heavenly Don't you know she's looking through the eyes Of a beautiful girl And I'll never rest a day Till she looks straight at me Don't you know she's looking through the eyes Of a beautiful girl Cause it's the only way she Welcome back. Just before the break, you heard Tommy and Jimmy Swarbrick sing what I think was a very, very important song. It was the inspiration for so many other singer-songwriters, people like my friend Fran O'Toole and Des Lee, people like that, weren't afraid anymore to dip their toe in the water and perform their own music. So you've, you decided when the Drifters split 1968, is it? Yeah, 68. 68. To take the bull by the horns and form the new band. Joe was going to do his own thing. Yeah. And you were going to do the, your own thing. Most of the drifters stayed with you, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, there was a bit of unrest in the band at the time. Um, it was going through a bad, a rough period. And um, I said it was leaving. And the uh, the boys came in at me and asked me, would I be interested if, if they live with me? It wasn't a planned thing, it just happened like that. Yes. And um, that was it. They left, the, all that was left of the Drifters was Ben and Joe. But of course Joe went on to huge international success did. afterwards. Of course he did. Yes. And um, um, Sid Ahi, our drummer, passed away recently. Yes, and uh, it was a very sad time. Yes. And we all met up and... You all met, met up and... Yeah. yeah. I, rem yeah. I, I remember seeing you. I mean, I remember being green with envy as a young fellow. I just wanted to be in that band. You know, I was a youngster look, looking up at, from the Collins Hall in Clonmel. Oh, uh, I remember the Collins Hall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 just up the road from us. I mean, as you say, Joe went on to great... So another band who wouldn't have the kind of resilience that you had, you know, might have perhaps idled on for a while and, and, and did something else. But you went on from strength to strength because, you, Jimmy, you joined the band. Yes, I came back from England and... Uh, you were in bands in England? Well, I was, yeah. I was in groups and I was also in an Irish band in London called right. The Saints and Sinners. Saints and Sinners. And I'm sure there are a lot of people still in London who remember that yeah. band. Yeah. Yeah. We were The Times when, the, when you formed the new band, wasn't it? It was The Times. The Times. The Times show band, yeah. Yeah, and, and it, it, was, it was a big success. Oh, Fantastic. Yeah. Phenomenal. We, we just had a, a few great years. Uh, we had a lot of hit records, uh, one after the other. Yeah. Uh, if Ma Could See Me Now Then. Yeah. Uh, that was very like, a, a sort of, a, in the style of Gilbert O'Sullivan. Ah, yes. Yeah. I mean, look, you were on the road. Yeah. What you were was a live jukebox. Thanks. Yeah. I thought, uh, I, actually, Tommy, I thought that that was a, better than anything Gilbert ever wrote. I just loved it. I, I thought it was, uh, you know, it was very evocative if Mark could see me now, you know. It was, yeah. it, it was a great lyric, wasn't it? It was, it was look, it's still popular to this day. Yes. Uh, very popular and still gets a bit of an airing on yeah. radio and that. You were pushing the boundaries. You were established Irish songwriters and people so often, they levelled 
this criticism against against Irish bands that you know they they were doing covers and they, they could, couldn't do it. But Ireland punched well above its weight when it came to Eurovision. It's won it more times than anybody else, hasn't it? Oh, far more, absolutely. Yeah. I can't remember how many times, but sure, we've won it so many times. I don't think every anyone will ever catch up. No. You know, you've great writers like Brendan Graham have won it and Johnny Logan and, you know, it's a fantastic record in the Eurovision. You had a particularly strong band musically. Oh, look, we had phenomenal musicians in the times. The excitement on stage, playing with those guys, I swear, I'll never forget it. It was just unbelievable. I would come off on a high after gigs. Uh, We had... um, Sean Kenny. Sean Kenny, phenomenal fabulous, guitar, fabulous player. guitar player. Mickey O'Neill on drums, yes. phenomenal. Again, poor Sean and Mickey have passed away. Yes. The, doc, the Doc Doherty too on young. piano. Des Doc Doherty on piano, the original Drifters, phenomenal player. Uh, great rock and roll player. Yes. You know, Jerry Lee Lewis job. Yeah. Great. Uh, we, Gene Bannon up the road in Coote Hill. Yes. Great sax player. Jimmy Horn on bass. Um, we had uh, also Andy O'Callaghan, who became one of Ireland's best uh, arrangers and wor- has done stuff for RTE for years and years. Who else? James Delaney. James Delaney, yeah, another phenomenal, played with Mary Black. And Funny enough, I gave James his first job. Yeah, great. He's, he's from down my neck of the woods. He's from Wine Gap, just outside Carrick and Shore, County Kilkenny. Yeah. Kilkenny. Great player. He's a great player. Yeah. Yes. So we had always just terrific musicians in the band and the buzz you would get from actually playing live will never be replaced there is nothing like that is there i mean as you say get on there there's there's no tricks or skullduggery or anything like that there's no big lighting production to hide any lack of talent you it was like being in a, a, a in a way it was like being in the ring for a, a fight there was no hiding place <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and for two solid hours i remember it was easter sunday night art a carnival outside longford 1800 people in the marquee and they rocking it and it's just memories that will never leave us. You were giving the people what they wanted. Well, there was well, certainly a buzz. It there. was a combination of both. They were giving us what we wanted as well. Well, know. I wouldn't underestimate the power of the show bands because the, 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 the actual the sound of the show band was unique. I mean, I know that lineup was used by all the great soul bands, Otis Redding, and all those bands yes, would have used that a very similar type of voicing on the brass and all yeah. that. But the showmans had this very punchy, danceable type. Uh, type. You, you go into a marquee and the first thing that hits you was the brass section. Oh, yes. That's right. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. That was Joey Gilhaney, I forgot. The... Joey Gilhaney, who was in the band, lives down the road in Swanlin Bar. One of the very best trombonists this country has ever produced. Tommy and Jimmy, I have to ask you this question because I've asked most people that we had on. If you could relive any one musical day of your lives, what would it be? Well, for me anyway, it was any one of the Eurovisions because I think it's, you're, it's very, uh, it's great honour to represent your country. Yes. No, no matter what you're at, and to sing for your country, I think it was one of the best honours we ever had. It's fabulous. That's, that's true. And uh, I remember the, the viewing figures uh, for the um, Eurovision, uh, the time we did it in Stockholm, there were 500 million, million people viewing it. Incredible. Nice to have... Yeah. Ten bob from each one of those in the marquee, <laughs> wouldn't it? Well, we did get a few <laughs> pence from each one. <laughs> so your moment that you really <laughs> I see your eyes are, are beginning to <laughs> cash register. What did we do with all that money, <laughs> Jim? <laughs> so what about you? We lashed out on these clothes that <laughs> cost a fortune. <laughs> the, gold, the gold suits. The I show band. The show band. <laughs> are you avoiding this question? What is your moment that you would relive, Tommy? Well, I would have to say, you know, looking back on those times, and I remember vividly that marquee in, uh, where was it, outside Longford? Arda. Arda. And, you know, it was phenomenal. There was a mass of people in front of you. 
all looking up at you and you boogieing them dead and Sean Kenny on his guitar and the band absolutely happy and it was going wild and it was just I can still see it and still feel it yeah. You're, we, we spoke about if Mark could, could see me now and also the, uh, you represented your country in Eurovision uh, I wonder if we can fuse the two of those together and if you can give us, give us a little bit of, of, of the two of those songs can you do that? that would be lovely with no problem we can do that okay. yeah. Steve, Jim, thanks for our week. It's Thank a, you, a, a, a pleasure and an honour to, to have you here on Showband Stories. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Pleasure. If man could see me now Drinking my wine Smoking my cigarettes If man could see me now what in the world would she say? Where is the boy who played with his toy? He took from the girl next door. And where is the lad who called to his dad to tell him the county score? If I could see me now. I begin explaining my present state living in sin and staying out much too late would she be pleased if she could see me now Your heart is free.